Far Away was a surprise for many people in 2023. This design from Quentin Lebra and Johannes Guppy is a puzzly card game in which players draft cards and then assemble them into a tableau. The game lasts only eight turns, so you're going to get eight cards and possibly bonus smaller cards as well and you put those cards in your tableau from left to right and each card has resources on the top and a scoring condition on the bottom so the first card that you play is setting up a scoring condition and you need to get the resources to satisfy that condition from the cards that come later and as you put more cards in your tableau you'll get more scoring conditions and then resources that are ideally all satisfying the scoring condition later so you put the cards down left to right and then resolve them right to left with the scoring the little teeny cards applying to everything so it was pretty neat nice drafting thing where you try to get all the cards just to put together the right way and get everything in the combo which is exactly the feeling of castle combo which is from french publisher ketchup games as is far away although the designers are different it's really the DNA of the designer coming through in this game, similar to Paper Tales or Wild Space, other titles that Ketchup has done, have this sort of puzzly feel. So this is a design from Gregory Grad and Matthew Roussel, who are also the designers of the 2025 game Zenith, which is coming from Playpunk, which is awesome. I played it in prototype. I'll talk way more about that game when it comes out. But for now, let's stick to the game that is actually available to people, or at least soon will be, as it's debuting for most people at Spiel Lesson 24 in October. So this is a puzzly card game for two to five players in which you are assembling a castle of cards that you're trying to score in a very similar manner to Far Away, but also not. Let me show you how it works. Castle combo includes two decks of cards, the village deck and the castle deck, or you could think of them as the peasantry and the nobility, or as I do, the brown deck and the silver deck. To set up, you shuffle the decks, you lay out three cards in a row from each deck and place the messenger token in front of the village row. You give each player 15 coins and two keys, and these are your starting resources with which you will begin to acquire cards. The game lasts nine turns, so you'll acquire nine cards and arrange them in a three by three grid to represent your castle. At the end of the game, you'll score those cards with each leftover key being worth one point. To buy the cards, you are going to pay the cost in the upper left-hand corner. You can buy cards only from where the messenger is located, so only these three village cards are available at the start of the game, if I am the first player. If I don't like those choices, I can discard a key and move the messenger to the other row. Or I can discard a key and throw these three cards away and turn up something else. I don't know what I'm getting, but I'm getting more villager cards. And that might matter because they specialize in different ways. For example, farmers, the yellow shields, only appear in the village deck. The blue shields, no, the regal cards, only appear in the castle deck. So there are six different types of shields. Every card has one or two shields on it. So they are differentiated, the decks, depending on what you're trying to get. So what else do cards have? They have an instant effect when you acquire them or an ongoing ability, and they have an in-game scoring condition. So the, all of those factors will affect what you want to buy. So your, for your first card, well, you might want something like this. It costs five coins, but it is worth seven points if it's at the bottom of your castle. It's in that bottom row. When you acquire a card, it comes over here and it's just floating around. You have no other cards. You're going to attach every other card to it, similar to King Domino. So you know that you can put this in the bottom row and get those seven points. It's not conditional, really. You're pretty, almost definitely, you're going to make this happen. When you acquire this card, you get a key per yellow shield. So I'd get, at spend five, I get two keys. Okay, because it counts itself, it's already in my castle. Other scores, well, they're not definite. This one, the Philosopher, for example, gives you 10 points if no military are in your castle. Philosophers don't like to hang out with the military, apparently. So this one is worth two points per coin on the purse. Hmm. So at the end of the game, you take any money you have left over and you put it on cards that have purses. So if I have five coins, I can put it on here. It's worth 10 points. But that means I have to plan to have that money 
at the end of the game, which means I can't do it, use it for something else. Okay, but you can start already to see how cards will combo together because this card is also has a purse and it has an instant ability that puts two coins on each purse in your castle. So if you get this card first and then you get this card, you put two coins from the bank on here and on here, and now you've gained eight points. You get more cards like this, super. You can really pump up your purses and lock in those points. This one is worth two points per different shield. It has two different shields itself. It's worth four. It can be at most 12. It gives you a discount on every castle card that you acquire for the rest of the game, similar to this one. So is that important to you? It costs only two. You're probably going to save a lot more than that over time if you focus on getting castle cards. Hmm. This one is worth two points per village banner. So it's castle itself, but you want to get village after that because you can maximize this at 16 points. So you can look at the different value of the cards along with the different effect, along with the different shields, along with the cost, because you only start with 15 coins, you decide what to do. So if I do acquire this card, I spent five, I gained the two keys, and it has an arrow on here to show that the messenger goes up. So some cards have those arrows. Here's one that drops it down to the village. This one goes up. Some don't. So as you get later in the game, that's another factor to consider because your left-hand neighbor is going to go after you. If you know they want one of these two cards, I'm going to push this up here. And now they have to spend a key to drop it back down. Or maybe they don't have a key and they can't do it. So they're out of luck. Or of course, I could just take the card they need, but that would assume, of course, that I can score it. So you replace it. You've got three cards in each row. Here's another purse card that also gives two. So the game changes a lot depending on the player count. If you have only two players, you can probably get at least two of these cards, right? I can buy this right now if I'm the second player. Maybe this is going to drop down and I can get one of the others unless it drops down and my opponent throws those away. Hmm, but it's not going to because this doesn't have an arrow, so it's going to stay up here. They can't both move it down and throw them away. So you are guaranteed of getting two of these cards, even though you'd want this one first, and then one of these two, and then the other. So everything sort of combos together as the cards come out. Okay, and this can have up to nine coins. Oh, 18 points. That's quite a lot. Let's see what else we have in the deck. Okay. Of course, you only draw one card at a time. You're not going to see all these, but it gives you some idea of what is in the deck. So this one costs five. It gives you one coin per blue shield of a neighbor or two keys straight up. In addition, it's worth two points per double shield card that you have in your castle. So if I'm looking for this next, it's worth I have to spend five. I can get two more keys. I can get a whole ton of keys because there's cards, of course, that will score for keys. Or I'd like to have options and be able to throw things away, find the cards I want. And this is worth four points already because I have this. But now I will, I will have spent 10 of my 15 money on two cards. That could be a problem. Okay, let's say I don't get this right now. So two points per different sh shield in the column, two points per purple shield in the same row and the same column, three per purple. Here are six per three shields of the same type. And one key per different shield in your castle. So if I get this one, I would get two keys. I have a red and I've got two yellow. I'm almost to six points. Maybe I'll look for this next. So again, see how things combo together. This gives you a discount on village cards. This one gives you one coin per space that's full in your grid. So again, not much, not worth much now, similar to this, but end game, much more valuable. It's really interesting how the value of the cards changes conditionally, both based on what you're already getting, what your neighbors are getting and where you are in the game. There's other options. Three coins per zero cost card. You go this poverty strategy, trying to get zero cards and see if you can make it all worthwhile. Money left over at the end of the game is not worth anything unless it's on purses. 
But if you go zeros, maybe you'll get a lot of money to put on purses that you get. So three coins per zero cost and two points per zero cost. Hmm. Five points in the middle, two points per yellow, or sorry, orange shield. So you can already see different combinations of things and how they will come together. Uh, your opponent, opponents gain one. That sounds terrible, but four points per blue shield in this column. I haven't seen that. Four points is a lot because we've seen the other ones and it's like two right? or three. Hmm. All players gain a key. Right? Lots of different things coming out here. And again, the value of everything is very relative as you're building up. So one point per green and one, or sorry, one coin per green and one point coin per yellow. So maybe I, if I spend five on this, again, it has to go next to my card in some way. Let's say I put it here. I have these three. I'd spend five and get three back. And I've already locked in four points. So try to combo those together. What else have we got? Some of these are very straightforward. You start to see if you're not in orange already, these are going to be very unattractive to you. Although this does have a discount. Maybe you, if you're not too far in the game, you can decide, fine, I'll start getting orange from this point on. Or two coins on each purse. Hmm, cost seven. And one point per coin in a purse across the entire board. That's huge. There is a play raid that deciphers all of these icons. There's a fair number of them in the game, but they're also fairly straightforward once you get going after one game. Here, you're going to discard a card from the village row, and then you gain the cost of that card as money. So right now it's only two or three. Cost four, but you'll get two or three back immediately. And then it's a purse and it's a purple and it's a green. So again, all the stuff tying together. All right. So last variety here, uh, one coin per empty space. So good early, bad late. All right. This now feels like you've seen all these before. Now you're just trying to put everything together. Eight points if you have at least one of each castle and village. Seems like that should be easy to get. Only cost zero. All right. You can run out of money. You can run out of coins. If you want, on a turn, instead of buying a card, you can just take the top card of the deck, wherever the messenger is, and add it to your castle. And let's put it where you can see it. Uh, you can see it right here. You get six coins from the bank and two keys. So if you're running out of money, then you can get more that way, but now you will have no scoring condition for that space. You don't want to do it, but maybe you have to. Or there are some cards that will score if you get a face down card. So you may intentionally get a face down card to give you more money, to give you more options, especially for the higher cost castle cards. One point per key. So they're already a point. Now you double them and now you're just on the hunt for keys from now on key per missing shield. So I'd get four if I acquire this card now. Cost nothing, get four keys. That would be eight points if I have this, and eight as well. Okay, everything's rolling together. Again, you're gonna do nine turns, you didn't score everything. This leads to the one real drawback of the game. You have this chart here, it's a seven wonder style chart. You go around the table, and Okay, everyone, what's your upper left card worth in points? Your upper middle, your upper right, and so on. Do that nine times, how many keys you have left, and then sum everything up. That can take a bit at the end of the game. So, yeah, it depends on whether you're, you're okay with that. Apparently, I'm okay with that because I did it. Possibly because I won, and then I won that one as well. Yes, this one, not so much, so we'll ignore that one. Only show the good stuff, right? Nine turns, count everything up. One for each key, all your cards here. Money is worthless unless it's on purses, and that's that. I've played Castle Combo four times on a review copy from Catch Up Games with two, three, and five players. And as I mentioned during the explanation, 
The player count varies things a lot because with two players, it's just you and one other person. So I'm keeping a real close eye on what's going to give you the most points. And it may be worth it for me to throw cards away so that you can't have something. I don't know what's coming up in its place, but I know what you can't get. It could be the vital thing that suddenly is dropping a huge amount of points on you. Sometimes it's worth it to spend that key and just gamble and see what happens. With more people, probably not as much because the cards on display are going to change a lot as you go around the table. So you have less of an ability to have something stay there from the draft where you pick one card and then hope to pick up the other thing later to go with it. You do have that anticipation sometimes where something comes up, the player to the left of you in a five player game had this, the card comes up and you're just like, I hope that stays there. Oh, it's still there. It's still there. It's still there. So you got this like little mini game of sorts where you're just like, is this going to be left to me? That's all I, that's all I want right now. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but you know, it's this little moments up and down of trying to get the right card, this gambling feel for what's coming up and how are you going to put things together the right way, right? Combo. It's all about combo. Or if you're in France, Chateau combo, because they do chateaus there. So it works really well. It feels so much like far away, although it's different in how you acquire cards here. It is a simultaneous, uh, every person is choosing a card from their hand. You reveal them at the same time. You're going to pick cards from a display based on the number on your card that you reveal. So you know, it's available, but you don't know which one of those cards you're getting and castle combo. You know exactly which card you're getting because you're buying it on your turn and no one can take that away from you on your turn from the choices that are available there. So, but things puzzle together similarly to far away and trying to get the right resources and score things, but there's a little more interaction, I guess, between in the castle combo because you're looking vertically and horizontally and across the board with the shields trying to match all those. And so you've got all these different elements that you're trying to just piece together the right way. And this, game hits me well. I often don't like drafting games in which each player is building their own thing, but I think that's because in a lot of those games, the scoring conditions are set outside of what I'm doing. There are just scoring conditions and then I'm drafting things and trying to match those conditions. It doesn't feel as interesting as these games where I am responsible for my own scoring conditions and then meeting them. I have more agency in what I'm doing, or at least it feels like it. I mean, it does because I'm buying the card that I want here. Uh, not so much, but you know, it works as well where you're trying to do that. So you're getting the cards you want, trying to fit everything together. And it has that element in the game where if you win, it feels like skill that you put together the right cards in the right way, everything came together. And if it doesn't work, then it's, ah, it's dumb luck, whatever, bad, ah, just things didn't go my way. Cards were not flipped at the right time or someone took the thing I wanted or whatever it is. It feels like you can blame luck if it doesn't work but skill if it does, even though clearly luck plays an element to it because it's a card game and sometimes the right card gets flipped up that's going to work perfectly for whatever it is you're doing. So there you go. A review of Castle Combo. Uh, if you're a fan of Far Away, well, then this will tickle that same feel. I don't know if you need two of them, but of course, who knows what anyone needs, right? We probably don't need this particular game, but you might like games. And if you do, this is a game. So maybe it's for you, maybe not. At least you now know how it works.